I love you. It is a privilege to be here this morning. My uh, home state is West Virginia. I was born in uh, Welch, West Virginia. My dad, <laughs> Welch, all right. My dad uh, was a coal miner. Uh, Welch, West Virginia uh, was the poorest city in America when I was a child. And uh, we were so poor, would you like to know how poor we were? One Christmas, I got this beautifully wrapped present. I opened it up, there was a battery in there and it said, toy not included. That's how poor we were. <laughs> the little slow here today, I notice. Uh, uh, but uh, my dad had his back broken three times in the mines before he was 30 years of age. I recount this story in a book that I wrote called Rethink Your Life. And I uh, tell about dad not only having uh, those injuries, but also the dreaded uh, black lung disease that miners often get. And I, uh, I watched my dad physically be uh, hurt in the mines and ultimately he said, uh, we're gonna move to Ohio to try to find a better life. So we moved to Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> and uh, and when, uh, when we arrived in Ohio, times were difficult and uh, dad could not get a job and we went several months without uh, him having a job, and during that time, the church fed and clothed our family. And I'm a Christian today because of the compassion that that church showed our family. When my dad did get a job, he went to work on a Monday morning and was killed in a tragic accident. That impacted me, even though I was converted at age four in a Sunday school class called to preach at age seven. and preached my first sermon when I was 14 years of age, but it impacted my mind. It impacted my, my heart. I went off to college at age 18 to Ohio Christian University in the southern part of Ohio, and the president of that institution was Dr. Melvin Maxwell. Now, Dr. Maxwell came by one day in the cafeteria where I was having lunch with a newfound friend by the name of John C. Maxwell. Now, John, of course, today has uh, written books that have sold over 20 million copies on the subject of leadership, but that day he had adopted me as a freshman. He was a senior, and we were talking, and his dad said, how would you guys like to go to a positive mental attitude rally tomorrow and skip class? And we said, anything to skip class. So we left uh, the college campus that next morning and, and went to uh, this positive mental attitude rally. They called them PMA rallies in Dayton, Ohio at UD Arena. And, and uh, we heard all kinds of great speakers. Uh, w. Clement Stone who said, what the mind can conceive, you can achieve. And there was uh, Earl Nightingale who talked about acres of diamonds and then there was Zig Ziglar who spoke about the fact that you could put garbage in your mind and garbage would come out of your mind. And, and I was captivated by positive thinking because the last speaker was Norman Vincent Pill who had just written the famous book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And, and so for the next few weeks, I began to try to come over, overcome all of the negativity that was in my life, the loss of my father, my poor upbringing, all the things that I was trying to cope with, and I was trying to think positive at every turn in my life. And some days I did well, and other days I didn't do so well as I made my way around the college campus and all the things associated with life. But one day, a few weeks later, I went to chapel. There was a speaker there by the name of Roy S. Nicholson. Roy S. Nicholson spoke on the Lordship of Christ. I, I believe we have that scripture for you that he used that day from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And it says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When he preached that message on the Lordship of Christ and gave an invitation for us to respond, I was the first one to step out of my seat. And that day, I experienced something from above like I'd never experienced before. The Holy Spirit seemed to wash away in my life that negativity. I went back to my seat and I wrote in the front of my Bible, a positive mental attitude without a positive faith will result in positive failure. I've lived by that thought because that day I realized I needed the positivity of the Spirit of Christ working in my life and through me. Essentially, what the great Apostle Paul was saying in Scripture when you read the book of Philippians is that we are to take every thought captive, that we are not to stoop to the low level of the thinking of the world, but we're to seize control of our mind and our attitudes in the power of the Spirit and live our lives accordingly. So I'd like to say, first of all, give God control of your mind. Don't stoop to the low living of the world, but let this mind, Paul says in Philippians, be that of Christ Jesus or this attitude. Or as it is said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let me give you four words that I think will help you. The first word is fix. Fix. Challenge your mind. I'll never forget coming to Lynchburg, Virginia in 1972 in an old beat up station wagon with senior pastor John Maxwell, with whom I was serving on staff at Lancaster, Ohio, with four other ministers. I don't know if the Holiday Inn is still here, but we were all so poor that all six of us went together and paid for one room and we stayed in the room and because I was the short guy in the room, I got to sleep on a cot. And we went to the, the first super conference for pastors that was held at the Thomas Road Baptist Church. And I heard Dr. Jerry Falwell speak on the subject of capturing your city for Christ. He challenged my mind and my spirit as a minister like never before. I even heard him say that he had a dream of building a university that would have at least 5,000 students that would play Division I sports and that would ultimately play Notre Dame and beat them in football. I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. When we drove off of that campus, I was uh, never the same as we left Thomas Road Baptist Church. We talked about it all the way back to Ohio. God began to move, and the next thing John and I knew, our church had grown by 272 people per Sunday. What a wonderful problem. And, and it soon became the fastest growing church in Ohio, and Dr. Elmer Towns came to speak for us and awarded the church the fastest growing church in the state of Ohio plaque. I was challenged that day, but Paul says, let this mind be in you. The real challenge is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The, the second word uh, that, that I'd like to give to you is not just fix, but I'd like for you to think about this with me as we put this word on the screen, that you should influence your mind, that you should filter the things that go in and as Zig Ziglar once said, remember, garbage in, garbage out. I believe that all of us should practice the, 
the discipline of silence every now and then. I believe, and I wrote about it in the book, Rethink Your Life, that, that we should go on a mind diet like people go on a diet to lose weight. Anyone in the room ever going on a, on a diet? I, I've been on a diet since I was 14 years of age. I've been on the North Beach and I've been on the South Beach diet, and I like the North Beach better because I can eat anything I want on that diet. Uh, you know, it, 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 a lot of people are on diets. In fact, in January, they said 70 million Americans went on, on a diet to lose weight uh, because they, 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 they just needed to trim down. They say by the end of the month, almost 100% of those people are, are off that diet. But, it, but this is a mind diet. This is a diet where you say, I'm going to shut off the iPod. I'm going to uh, for a while. I'm going to practice the discipline of listening, of silence. I, I, I'm going to turn off the TV and, and discipline my life, and I'm, I'm going to, to not put negative things into my mind. All of these media influences are wonderful, but when they consume our mind to the point that they push us away from that which is spiritual, then we need to allow God to speak to us and, and transform us and not conform to the world, but conform to the image of Christ because every message that I read is negative. I read something the other day that really troubled me because I'm of the baby boomer generation, and I was reading the Wall Street Journal, and it said, baby boomers to fuel the funeral industry. Now, I didn't particularly like that because they, they said, they're happy some of us are going to die and funeral homes are going to make more money, you know? I, I mean, you, 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 even if you read ESPN, and I did, uh, I mean, the scroll on ESPN, and I did just this morning, it's hard to find anything positive that's going on in the world of sports even. They always focus on who's messed up their life, if you think about it. So filter. The next word is form. As you give God control of your mind, watch out for your associations. I have never written a book on parenting. And I've had publishers ask me to do it, and I just don't think I know enough about it. And now that I have grandchildren, I'm pretty sure that I don't know that much about it. But uh, I do know this, that I, I believe every parent has to watch over their children's relationships. Your relationships make or break you. Form positive relationships. I mean, even in the ministerial uh, gatherings that I've been a part of, I found out that even ministers can be negative. I know you're surprised. Uh, when I moved to Oklahoma City 27 years ago, I, I was invited to be part of a ministerial group, and I was so pleased because I didn't know anyone there. And, and I went the first day, and I was so thrilled to be able to sit and drink coffee with them at, at a restaurant after I dropped my sons off to school. And, and, and I, I, I heard all kinds of negative stuff out of them. And, and after about three weeks, I told my wife, I said, you know, they talk bad about everyone. They talk bad about the, the mayor. They talk bad about the governor. They talk bad about fellow pastors. They talk bad about the person that wasn't there on, that, on, particular, on a particular day. And I have to assume that on the day I was not there, they talk bad about me. And, you know, I'm like my old friend Zig Ziglar. I don't want to hang around people who brighten up the room when they leave the room. I want to hang around people who brighten up the room when they enter the room. And I believe that, that our relationships have a tremendous impact on the way we live our lives. Uh, but there's another word that I want to give you, and that word is feed. Fill your mind with the Holy Scriptures. When I was 14 years of age, I had a Sunday school teacher who made all of us in the room pledge that the next week we would come back with a Scripture verse that we had memorized and that we would quote it. And all nine of us came back the next Sunday, and she said, are you ready? And surprisingly, all nine of us were ready. And I remember that I quoted Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. It might surprise you, but I've quoted that verse every day right through this morning when I've gotten up to start the day. 
If you could focus your mind on the Lord for a few moments and on the Holy Scriptures, it'll make a difference in your life. Do you know that there are over 7,000 positive promises in God's Word, and it can make a difference every day? You do not have to live your life on the negative side of, of it. You can live on the positive side as you acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in your inner being. Not long ago, just before I was elected general superintendent, I pastored for 40 years, started when I was 17 years old as a pastor in Newark, Ohio. God bless those people. I can't imagine a junior and high school pastor in anybody's church, but I did. Uh, uh, but I, I, uh, I was preparing to preach on a Sunday morning. I had been to Alaska to speak on, on Friday, flew back on Saturday. It was a nine-hour flight. I got back to Dallas. Uh, my flight was canceled, and at midnight, I'm renting a car and I'm driving home. I've been in a car wreck uh, a few days earlier. I'd been scheduled for surgery. My right, soldier, uh, my right shoulder was just aching like a toothache. I, I couldn't raise my arm above my side, uh, and, and I was in constant pain, and so I'm driving home at midnight. I know I got to preach on Sunday morning and uh, the shoulder's aching. I finally get home at four o'clock in the morning, fall into bed, sleep a couple hours, go down to the church. My prayer partners pray with me. I, you know, I sit down at my, uh, my desk and I'm trying to get focus for the message. And, a, and an email pops up and it's from a friend of mine. And, and uh, I, 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 I thought, man, this is really good. And so I just printed it out. I thought it'll fit with my sermon on the wisdom of words. And I was, and I was going to talk about the wisdom of words. And, and, and so I just printed it and thought at some point I'll just use it. So I put it in my Bible and I was ready to go. Uh, and, and I walk in to preach that morning and I, 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 I was just jet lagged. I said this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of incest. And I said, no, that's not what I want to talk about. I said, what I want to talk about is incest. And I go, no, that is not what I want to talk about. Just a moment. So I turned around and, and, and I said, Lord, help me to get my mind straight. I said, this morning, I want to talk to you on the subject of incest. I said, folk, would you help me? I said, what are those little creatures that crawl around on the earth? And a thousand people said, insects. I said, that's what I want to talk about this morning insects. And, and they had a lot of fun with me doing that in the first service, and I didn't make the same mistake in the second, third service. But, but, but you know, as I was trying to get my mind right, the Spirit began to anoint me as I preached. As I moved along in that sermon, you know, I was filled in the power of the Holy Spirit moving in my life. And it, and it came that moment when I, when I said, this is a time to pull those scriptures out. And so I began to read, and I just want you to hear some of the verses that, that my friend, Dr. Bill Birch, had sent me that I read that morning. Never again will I say I can't, according to Philippians 4.13, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then I read, never again will I confess lack. Philippians 4.17 says, for my God shall supply all my needs. And then I read another passage, never again will I bow before weakness, for the Lord is the stronghold of my life. Man, I'm really feeling something there. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm feeling this message. And then I said, never again uh, will I live with worry and frustration because I can cast all my cares on Him who cares for me. And, and then I read, never again. Will I confess condemnation? For there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and then I read, never again will I plead ignorance. For Christ Jesus is made unto me wisdom from God. And then I read, never again will I tremble before sickness. By his stripes I am healed. And I, I looked over and this arm that I couldn't raise any higher than my side it was straight up in the air. And there was no faith healer present. But in that moment, I realized that God had healed me while I was reading the scriptures. The surgery was canceled and God truly touched me. I slept on that 
shoulder this morning, and I'd like to give him a little glory and praise for what he did in my life right there. But as much, but as much as I like to say to you that God healed me and there's healing for our our bodies through Scripture and through the power of the Spirit He created us and made us. I want to tell you there's a healing for your mind today. When when you feed your mind on the Holy Scriptures, He can cleanse your, your life and your heart and make you whole before the Almighty and give you the authority to walk as you live for Christ in God's big world. There's another thing I'd like to challenge you to do now that you know all this. I'd like to challenge you to shine God's light on what is right. After you've given God control of your mind, He's working in your life, you ought to make a difference in this world. I was so happy to see Chris the Christian Service Award today because that's what we ought to do. We ought to live it out. Our walk ought to match our talk. There ought to be integrity in our Christian living. Uh, There's a book out that I love. It's called How Full Is Your Bucket? And, And it's not a Christian book. It's written by Donald Clifton and Tom Rath. And in that book, they say we should have the go-giver attitude. And that, that if you have a business, that you should invest in other businesses and in so doing, mystically, wonderfully, your business will do well. Now, that sounds like a Bible principle to me, maybe Luke 6, 38, given it shall be given unto you. But I think we have been called to make a difference in our world and every day as Christians, we should shine God's light on what is right. I think one, we should replace, and we'll put this on the screen for you, anger with love. You know, there's a lot of angry people in God's big world. If you don't believe that, get out on the freeway someday. Secondly, I believe that we should replace fear with faith. When I wrote that book, Rethink Your Life, I made a statement in it. I said, to get your mind right, you should audit your beliefs. And so I did an audit on my own personal beliefs, and I was able to reduce it to one sentence. I hope the theologues here today will appreciate what I have to say. But I am so simple, and so I was able to reduce what I believe to this statement. Are you ready for it? You want to hear it? Here's what I believe. I believe my God can do anything. I absolutely refuse to limit God. I believe my God can do anything. I believe my God can do anything. It's not important today what I believe. What do you believe? Do you believe that God can still heal broken hearts, set the captive free, cause lame men to get up and walk? Do you believe with all of your heart that God loves the word impossible? I believe my God can do anything. What do you believe? I chose that day to replace my fear of loss of loved one poverty, everything else, and believe that God could give me the faith to love people and to do His work and preach His Word. I believe also we should replace judgment with acceptance. I do not believe that God has called us to condemn the world. We have been called to seek and to save the lost as Jesus did. It is our calling to live it out and to make the goodness of Christ attractive, but also I believe we should replace sadness with happiness. The happiest people in the world ought to be Christians, don't you agree? I mean, we need to give the world a smile. Do you know that the average adult only smiles 15 times a day? But they say that the average child smiles up to 500 times a day. What happens to people like me from age, you know, six to 61? Why do we lose our smile? I tell you what, my grandkids make a difference in me, and I've got a grandson who's five years old. I think he's going to be a preacher because he always wants to make announcements. And, and the other, other day at our family gathering, he came in, took his coat off, and he said, I have an announcement to make. So we all stopped. He said, listen up, everyone. He said, uh, I just watch Cars too, just for your information. He said, I'm a secret agent. My brother Mark said, not anymore. The day went on, we had dinner, and uh, we were in the kitchen, everybody's putting on their coats, we're getting ready to leave, and my grandson says, listen up everyone, I have another announcement to make. He crawled up on the bar stool in the kitchen, he said, I have bad news and I have good news. He said, the bad news is I have an ear infection, but the good news is I'm not contagious. (laughs) 
I don't know about you, but that makes me smile. And I think we ought to find some enjoyment in life every day, replace sadness with happiness. But let me move this message forward. How about allowing God to change you today? I'm talking to you. You're thinking about someone that should have heard this message, but I think God wants to talk to you right now. And, and how should you allow Him to change you? Well, I think you start by reversing the way you get out of bed. It's not quite what you think, but you have a choice every morning. Paul Martin said years ago when I was a teen, you have a choice every morning, you could say, good Lord, it's morning. Or you can say, good morning, Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be exceedingly glad in it. I've chosen to get up every day and believe this is the best day of my life. God's given it to me, and I'm going to seize every moment for His glory and honor. How about you? Yeah. Hey, you're great. Let's say. Secondly, say I love you often. I got a phone call one day from my lifetime friend and mentor, Dr. Almer Towns. I was in Phoenix going to the airport, Sky Harbor Airport, when the phone rang. I pull over to the side of the road because when he calls me, I want to listen. I, I can tell you love him a lot. And here's what he said. He said, Stan, I love you. I said, well, I love you, Dr. Towns. He said, Stan, I really love you. And I said, I love you, Dr. Towns. He said, no, I love you. I said, I love you. <laughs> and then he got serious, and I could tell that he was shedding a tear. He said, Stan, I want you to promise me something. I said, okay. He said, Stan, I want you to promise me that every time you talk to your son, Seth and Adam, that you'll say, I love you. I said, I'll do my best. He said, that's not good enough raise your right hand. And there I was with cell phone in one hand, parked beside the road, cars whizzing by. Got it up? Yes, sir, I got my hand up. I promise. Sound like Jimmy Breland, honey, your Sunday school teacher. I promise, I promise that every day when I talk to my son, Seth and Adam, I'll say I love you. You know, that wasn't easy at first because uh, I truly do love my sons, but it was a little awkward. But I started saying it, and you know, Dr. Towns, now they beat me to it, and now my grandsons do it. And I want to thank you for putting a discipline in my life. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't he great? I love you. I really do love you. You'll never be able to love me more than I love you. <laughs> but say I love you. You know, just do it. Tell your family. Call someone today. Tell them you love them. And then… Let me, let me tell you another thing. Become a giver, not a taker. I'm telling you what, we're living in a me first kind of world. And I believe that the most generous people in the world should be Christians. And then finally, focus on the future. Let me tell you just a quick story. I pastored, as he said, in Washington Courthouse, Ohio. And a few months ago, they asked me to come back and speak. And it was 30 years since I'd been back to the church. And I wondered who would be there, and I wondered if Kim Hawk would be there, a Down syndrome girl that I had dedicated as a baby. I wrote about her in my book, The Buzzards Are Circling, but God's not finished with me yet. And, and uh, uh, I, I wrote about her playing the piano at Christmas at age nine for an offertory with one finger, Jesus loves me, this I know, and how angels came near. She was there. Kimmy always told me she loved me, and one other thing, when I asked her how she was doing, no matter how sick she was, she would always say, terrific. That was her word, always. Well, that day she was there, and they had me doing a book signing for that book, Buzzards Are Circling. They brought her up the aisle in a wheelchair. She had oxygen on, and, and I knew that the family had said that she probably wouldn't live much longer, and I said, Kimmy, how you doing? And she said, terrific, I love you, Pastor Stan. Standing beside me was the captain of the Green Bay Packers football team, A.J. Hawk. 
The Hawk family had been longtime members of that church, and A.J. had, had just gotten my book, and, and I had signed it, and I, I'd asked him to sign my bulletin because I knew it would be worth more in a garage sale than my book. And so, so he had signed the church bulletin, and I'd signed the book. He walked over to Kimmy, and he said, Kimmy, he said, you're my hero. She was his dad's sister. And he said, he turned to page 42, that story about her playing a piano. He said, would you sign my book? And I'd had all kinds of people in line, and he had kids in line, and he was signing a book, and all of a sudden, everything stopped. And people began to get pieces of paper and everything else. And they lined down through that 1,300-seat sanctuary all the way down to the front as they waited while everyone's hero signed her name on page 42 of my book. And then I thought, well, I wrote the book. I want her to sign my book. And she signed mine. And I thought, you know, her outlook on life is life is terrific. And that day, I picked my own word. And my word today is outstanding. My question for you is, what's your word? My word's outstanding. Find one today and go out there and give the world a smile. Thank you very much. God bless you all.